you have your Bibles, you want to follow along, we're going to read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. And what I'd like to do, I felt that I would like to do is um, just read um, the whole uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just read the whole chapter through and then we'll talk about it a little bit. And then uh, we'll have communion. And then God will, God will honor our hearts as we unite our faith together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll start with verse 1. And uh, in this passage of scripture, you'll see the Apostle Paul is leading the church of Corinth into the spiritual things. Now, these people are born again. They're born again believers. They, they're even filled with the spirit, but yet they, they lacked a lot of understanding. And the world kept trying to pull them back into, into that sickness and that disease. The Bible says the wages of sin is death and pull, pull them away from God and their natural earthly desires tried to rise up. How many know that you gotta, you gotta um, defeat those natural earthly desires that try to come up in you to cause you to, to go against the word of God? We have to, we've been given that power because Satan wants to take you down roads that will kill, steal, or destroy. That's the only thing he's gonna do. That's his plan for your life. God's plan is that you live life abundantly, amen, and to have peace and health and victory. And so Paul is, is, is explaining to them just how important it is to stay with the things of God. How many know that you can be a believer and still struggle with thoughts that are not very um, holy? Whether it's anger whether it's some kind of bondage or addiction you got yourself into, that's just your lower nature, just trying to rise up and take control. But by the power of God in you, you can break every chain, amen? And you can experience what's called the fruit of the Spirit. And that's the love and joy and peace and all these wonderful, beautiful things that, that God has for us. No one living in the world is truly happy no one living in the world is truly satisfied because they're operating off of, off of lust. What's one thing about lust that we can all say is true? Lust is something that can never be fulfilled. It just leaves you wanting more and more and more, and that leads to bondage. That leads to addictions. That leads to um, just tearing down not only your life, but the ones around you. We don't need that. We don't need nothing like that in our life, do we? And so this is encouraging words. So New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Paul says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan reverie. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Verse 12. If you think you are standing strong, 
Be careful not to fall. Temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I am saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we will all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? I am saying that food offered to idols has some significance. What am I trying to say? Am I saying, he says, that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare? Do we dare to... Arouse, I'm sorry, do we dare to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than he is? You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising question of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asked you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me, I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And so that's the full length of what he's talking about here. And he's clearly telling them that you belong to Jesus. And everything that we do are not only for the benefit of us, but for the benefit of others. Yes, you are free in Christ, but you are not to use that freedom and, and as a liberty to sin. We are free from sin. Amen? Sin's hold, sin's bondage over us. We are free from sin's ability to separate us from a holy God because we've been bought and paid for and washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are born again children of God, and we are to use the grace and the power of God and the love of God to, to grow closer to God and closer to one another. Amen? We are to, we are to lift each other and to, and to remember that if it not, we're not for the grace of God, we wouldn't even be anywhere close to where we are now. And so in verse 31, he says, the whole gist of it is this. Whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, just do it for the glory of God. You know, there's been times that uh, people tried to drag me into an argument. Anybody know what that feels like? There's been times that people have said things 
I'm talking about in a church setting now, just keeping it here. There's been times that people have said things that as soon as they said it, it set something off in me. And it wasn't good. I'm not being spiritual right now. It was, it was, it was um, irritation. It was a little bit of anger, whatever it may be. And, and it, usually because it's just not loving or kind or thoughtful. And you know, when, when these things come up within me, I don't say anything a lot of times. You know why? I want to glorify God. Amen? I want to glorify God. How many know as believers you have to pick and choose your battles too? And then we have to look at the other person and say, you know what, I'm going to love that person through whatever difficult situations they're going through. And so, so many times we act like we're in the world. And, and you know the Bible says you're not to speak what comes into your mind right off the bat. That's, that's dangerous. Some people take uh, pride in that. We're like, I say what's on my mind. Well, hey, I'm going to try to help you out today. <laughs> I don't know if I would. Because what you, what's on your mind at the moment might not be kind, might not be loving, might not be edifying. It might be all your flesh just trying to vent, but there's a problem with that. The person who is hearing you, they are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they are holy, and they are sacred. And so if what you're saying isn't treating them with the love and respect that they, that they deserve through Jesus Christ, don't say it. But you always got to keep things down the middle of the road. Amen? So Keeping it in the middle of the road, let me say this. I'm not saying that you don't, you don't uh, confront issues when they need to be confronted. I'm not saying that you don't discuss things, but you have to do it under the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says be quick to listen, slow to speak, and then slow to get angry. Sometimes I think we do it backwards. We get angry first. We're always talking, and we never listen. Am I the only one? We are doing what we do for the glory of God. To lift him up. To thank him for our salvation. Does that make sense? And so this is what Paul's trying to tell them. Because not only were they struggling with the things of the world. You know, they came out of a lot of terrible things. The, the people at Corinth. Paul went to Corinth and he preached the gospel. A, a pagan land. And you know what happened? They received it. They received the gospel. So what's the next step? Start a church. He was an apostle. That's why he started a church there. But even though, now here's the part I, point I want you to get. They were born again, spirit-filled believers, but yet Paul said they're carnal. They're driven by their flesh. They're driven by the world and world's emotions and the things of the world. He didn't say it in this passage, but he says it in this same letter. And he says that you should be spiritual by now. They weren't growing spiritually like they, like they needed to. So Paul's uh, gingerly and lovingly bumping them back to the grace and love of God. And we have to be careful of that because when you serve God, there could be temptations that come into your life to say, you know what? I don't need God. I don't need the things of God. That's a lie from the devil. You need God. And there might be a temptation that says, well, I don't need my church either. That's a big lie. That's a big lie. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that, that everybody has to be locked in here like you're in prison. Nobody's chained to those seats, right? <laughs> but what I am saying is while you're here, we have to reverence and honor each other. And if not here, you're to be somewhere. Amen? Somewhere glorifying God. Somewhere being a, lifting of, a lifter of people. You're to be somewhere honoring God and reverencing the people that you're with. So if not here, do it at the next place. But just do it. Because that's what God wants us to do. Amen? And you know what? There are shiftings and movings of God's people. There are times where God says, I'm going to move you here, and I'm going to move you there. And this, I understand that completely. I'm not saying that, that, that you don't move from churches. But what I'm saying is wherever you're at, 
Start loving the people. Amen? Start putting yourself in the other person's shoe. And, and, and realize that, that li like I said earlier, life is hard sometimes. And sometimes people will take the harshness of life out on you. Even in church. Now, if you're a visitor here, I don't want, I want to know we're a really good church. <laughs> but I'm just going to let you know, we have human beings here. Right? Honestly, right? Yes. And sometimes people, they come in, I'm, like, I'm thinking, man, they got up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> but you know what? Usually when they come in and do the praise and worship and getting started, we can help them, surround them, and lift their spirits up. But I can't guarantee you that everybody is going to say the right things. Because we, we are growing up um, Christians here. We're growing up uh, children of God. And the Bible says, Paul says, there's a process to growing up spiritually. He said, first you're a baby, and then you're a child, and then you're an adult, spiritually speaking. So can you have a 70-year-old baby? Yeah. Can you have a 70-year-old baby Christian who went to church for 30 years? Yeah, if they didn't open their heart and let God in. They're tough to deal with. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Can you have someone that's been born again for a year and they're 18 years old and can they be a mature Christian? Sure they can. Amen. It's messages like this that help us get to where we need to go. And so we can... Glorify God, because that's the purpose, isn't it? I wanted to call your attention here to, uh, in verse 12. And he says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. In verse 12, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. Who's that written to? The believers, the born again child of God, he's writing this to the church. And so we have to be careful not to fall. Fall where? Fall into the sins of the world. Fall out of love. Fall out of fellowship. Fall out of the things of God. But let me say this, that, that as believers, none of us are perfect. And so when we make mistakes and we have struggles, here's what a mature believer does. They go right to God with it. Because the Bible says, go to the throne of grace with, with, uh, with, a, with a, a, a pride, a good pride. With the with expectancy that God's going to help you in your time of need. The Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he ever makes intercession for you. Jesus is expecting you to have issues and to have trouble because you're a human being. He knows what it's like to be a human being. He sympathizes. So we go to him. But we don't give our lives over to the world and slide back into what you came out of. Don't you know by now there's nothing back there? Haven't you been hurt enough by that? Haven't, don't you remember the emptiness and the sadness and how the devil tried to destroy your life? You, there's nothing back there for me. Is there anything back there for you? And so we're not to go that way. We're not to let anger get the better of us, too. And we're not to, like I said, disrespect our brothers and sisters in the church. We are to keep moving forward as one solid body in Christ. And so let me say this. There is a difference between falling down and getting back up, right? Then doing this, sliding the whole way back. The world calls that backsliding, or some of the church. You can use that term if you want to. There's nothing back there for you. Did you see what the, which way the world's headed? Do you want to go that way? Do you want to go through that deception and that darkness and that evil and that, that frustration and that fighting and that just, the world's angry. 
You don't have to be angry. You can be full of joy in the middle of their anger. And God is, is, is impl imploring his children, keep focusing on me. Keep joining together because there's strength and there's power in numbers. And keep moving forward. If you truly honor God and you spend time with him and you do what he says, he's way more than enough than you'll ever need. Because only God can satisfy your soul. Only God can give you that peace that the world's looking for. Only God can set you free. Only God can give you joy. Does the Bible talk about joy unspeakable and full of glory? Is that found in the world? You believe the word of God is true, right? Does it say there's joy unspeakable and full of glory in the world? No, there's sadness. Sadness, they're sad. They're hurting, they're lost. You have the joy of the Lord. Does the Bible talk about the peace of God that passes all understanding? That belongs to you and belongs to me, but we have to stay focused and honor God and honor each other and to press in to the things of God. And he'll continue to develop you and grow you in the spirit, grow you in your thoughts and your heart, grow you in your, in, in your mind, right? I mean, if God's asking you to take a certain path because he's taking you somewhere, if you keep going on the wrong path, what can he do? How many of you have adult children? You know, once they reach a certain age, you know, we were just talking the other day, I forget who it was with. Once you turn 16, boy, you get that driver's license. Man, that's, that's a whole new world. Freedom. I remember those days. And we had, we had one mother say, you know, when, when my son got her, his driver's license, it freed me up too because I didn't have to run him everywhere. But you know, once your children grow and they grow into an adulthood, they have to make their own choices. And how many, how many know sometimes that you have to watch them make these choices against your advice, against your will, against the, the things that you've taught them, and, and, but they have, to, they have to be the one to make their own choices. Amen? God's in the same boat. He will not violate your will. He takes a message like this by the Spirit of God and by the fellowship that we have, and he speaks right into your heart, and he says, look, if you're wandering away from me, come home. It's not time to wander out there into the world. It's not time to let the world poison your mind. Re the Bible says renew your mind by reading the word and hearing the word. Renew your mind. Keep coming to church and fellowshipping with other believers. Every time you come to church, God puts something in you that's supernatural, that builds upon what you already have. And if you keep coming to church, it'll be day by day, we'll, we'll be month by month, and then year by year, keep serving God. And after a year, you'll look back and you'll say, look how far God brought me. A lot of people, when they first come into church, they don't know anything about the love of God. Nothing. They're full of condemnation. They're full of guilt. They're full of, of low self-esteem. I promise you, you stay here a year. Give me a chance to get the messages out. Give me more than two weeks. <laughs> give me some time. Give us some time, because I'm not the only one that preaches. Give, give Dad some time. Give Pastor Dane some time, and, and whoever else is, is over the pulpit. Sister Leah, give us time, and we'll show you what a loving God is truly like. But look, he says, be careful that you fall, that you don't fall. Look at verse 13, because I want to read this, because this... Because we're taught wrong, a lot of people are taught wrong, they read things into the scripture sometimes that's not there. And so, verse 13, it says, the temptation in your life is no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And so what he's saying here is that when you experience temptation, just know that everybody experiences the same things. The same type of things. Amen? The same similar things. The devil's not allowed to break out some brand new temptation on you that's never been known to man. It's all the same tricks. He works on your flesh. 
He works on the, on, on the pride angle of it all. He works in, in the lust. He works in, 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 in these things to try to get you to move out in, in uh, the things of the world. But we all experience the same, similar things, right? But, so the temptation in your life are no different from what others experience. Look at verse, this next one. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So this is not saying that God will tempt you and test you and try you. It's not saying that, is it? The Bible says that God tempts and tests no man. You're going to be tempted and tested and, and go through trials because you live in a fallen world. But when these temptations, tests, and trials comes, God is faithful. He'll not allow the devil. The devil is not allowed through the, pro through the promise of God to, to overwhelm you and to take you under. You have the power to withstand him. God will make a way of escape. That's what he's saying. Is this written to the church? Like I said, this is not an Old Testament scripture. I'm thankful for Old Testament scripture. This is born again, spirit filled people that are being instructed. You got to be careful so you don't fall back into that world. And temptation is coming to all of us, but don't you fall for it. You hold your ground and you have an understanding that the power of God is in me. And I'm going to withstand that in Jesus name. And God will make a way of escape. Sometimes he gives you your way out through just knowledge and understanding. Say, for instance, if someone's coming out of a, a crowd that gets into things, things that aren't good for you. I mean, know that God wants you to, God wants you to do the right thing so you can take care of your body. And say, like, someone's coming out of a, a crowd that they're, they're into, like, hard drugs and alcohol and just a, that's an over-party life. And, and God will make a way of escape. You know what it might be? He might tell you, okay, stop hanging around with that crowd. Well, there you go. That thought that you get is not just something that you thought of. It's God showing you the way out. Now, let me say this, though. You have fam I'm not saying disassociate with people, but, but you got to know what environment you should be in and what you shouldn't be in. Amen? Yes. And remember, when you go to your families and you, go to, to, you have family gatherings, once you serve the Lord, remember, you changed, they didn't. Mm -hmm. And you be loving and you be kind, but show them what a life with God is like. Show them power. Show them joy. Show them peace. Yes. Amen? But God might simple say, simply say, okay, you know what? You need to come into the church and fellowship with the believers and let me show you the new way, the living way. It's okay. Don't be afraid to, to make changes because it's through those changes that God's going to add to your life. Amen? He's going to add good things. He wants to teach you more and more about who he is and what he has for you. And so, and then in closing here, and then we're going to have communion. In verse 17, he says, And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Amen? And then in verse 16, he says, When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? Amen? Amen? And so what he's trying to tell them, back in that day, they, they had one big loaf of bread and they would tear off the, the loaf of bread and, and he's making that comparison. Just as you're tearing off that loaf of bread, we're all tearing off the same loaf of bread. We're all one body. Amen? Now today, we have individual wafers, but it's, it, the, the same principle is true. We are all one body. And I can say it this way, just because we're not tearing off the same loaf of bread, do not forget that we're all one body. And so communion is not only a time to get, go before the Lord and to just um, anchor our faith down into him. Communion is also a time to remember that we are one body together. 
And communion is a time if we are feeling um, any kind of hard feelings or any kind of unforgiveness against anyone, especially in your body, it's time to forgive. Amen? It's time to let it go. That's where the power of God's at. That's part of what Paul means when he says you rightly discern the Lord's body. We are the body of Christ, are we not? And then when you drink this, 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 this juice, we're all partaking in the same blood. Amen? The same blood that was shed for me was shed for you. The same blood that cleansed me cleanses you. My Lord is your Lord. Right? My Savior is our Savior. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father for all of us. He's the head of the body. We are his body. And so we remember this when we take communion. So do you have your wafer? We're going to just take a, f- a few minutes here to have communion. And so Jesus said, when you, when you take of the bread or the wafer, understand this. You're demonstrating, and it's symbolic of his body that was broken for me and for you. Amen? You know the Bible says, by his stripes you were healed. When Jesus died on the cross, it's called the redemptive work. That means he purchased you from the dominion or the authority of Satan. Now you belong to to God in Christ. And he also purchased your body. And so if you're in here and you have any kind of sickness or any kind of thing plaguing your body or your mind, does the Bible say the chastisement of our peace was upon Christ on the cross? He bore that. Amen. I believe when they put this crown of thorns on his head, it covered it, covered it all. Yes. Healing for your mind. There's supernatural healing here this morning for, for, for depression and sadness and, and, and those things. So I want you to remember that as we take this, this um, bread and eat. So you can break it and eat. So I just want to give you a few seconds and, and just if you bow your heads and just identify to you and to the Lord, to the Lord right now, what is it in your, in your body that's not functioning the way God intended it to be? Let me give you a little, little hint. If it's causing pain, it's not God's will. It's not his intent. And God, God wants you well. And so I want you to focus on that in your body, any part of your body, any part of your mind. You just broke the, the wafer, which represents the broken body of Christ, and you just, just brought it into yourself because you were saying, I am one with Jesus. I am one with this body of believers. And together, we are going to believe God for healing for all of us. Healing for all of us. And so let me pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak healing into each and every one of our bodies right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that right now, knees are being healed. Right now, cartilages are being restored. Ligaments are being being restored, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for healing of kidneys, Lord. Thank you for restoring kidney function to 100%. Thank you, Lord, right now for healing the livers of our people that have issues, Lord. Thank you for that the impurities in the liver is is being cleared out now. For Jesus' body was broken for us, and we have a right, and we have a privilege to declare these things by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for healing our eyesight. Lord, I I speak to those people in here right now, thank you, Father, right now, that are worried that they're losing their memory, worried that they're not gonna be able to remember things someday because they're thinking of other people that are going through the same things. Right now, Father, we declare that that will not happen. They'll not lose their memory, They'll not lose their mental sharpness. Their brain will function healthy as you intended in Jesus' name, Lord. For, Lord, we know that, that when we grow older, it doesn't mean that, that we, we lose memory. People have connected the two, but that's just a trick of the devil. 
We have strong, healthy minds in Jesus' name. Amen? We thank you for it. Now we'll take the grape juice. And now, this grape juice, it's just a representation of the blood of Jesus. It's just saying, you know what? Jesus said whenever you take communion, do it in remembrance of him. We're remembering him, right? Why did he want us to remember him? Because he knew that we were going to need to remember him. <laughs> and I want to tell you here, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to worry about ever spending one second in a place called hell. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. Amen. You belong to God. God seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. He is yours. You are his because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're to, you're to have peace in that. Amen. What I'm talking about here is let's live for God so that we can glorify him. Amen. And let's, let's um, live a big, beautiful, powerful life that affects other people. Don't let the devil run you all over the place looking for love in all the wrong places. Trying to find fulfillment that only he can bring. I can save you of all that trouble. You, all you need is God. Amen. And he'll make your life so bright. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say they get saved older in life. And they'll say this. I wish I'd have known back then what I know now. It would have saved me so much trouble. You know, the Bible says there's earthly, sensual, and devilish wisdom. Don't follow it. Follow the Word of God by the Spirit of God. You live in a society right now that, that it's very divisive and it's by plan. Because the devil says, divide and conquer. So he divides people through politicians and through, through news media. It's div divisive, 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 and then he, and he brings fear with it. I ain't playing that game. You can take your, your ball and your bat and go home. I always say that because I remember when I was a kid, we used to play baseball with a tennis ball outside my parents' house. We had a big row of hedges that was a home run fence. It was just me and another guy against my brother and some other guy. We're just kids, you know. The only thing that would stop us, we played from sun up to sundown. The only thing that would stop us was either darkness or Mr. Softy. <laughs> Anybody remember Mr. Softy? Those chimes coming down the back road. We said, okay, time to take a break. <laughs> but my brother had a guy on his team that he was a little temperamental. And he didn't like to lose. And so you had to appease him or else he'd take his ball and his bat and go home. And you can't play two on two anymore. You need four, right? And so, say like if I would hit a home run, I wasn't allowed to show any emotion. Because he would get mad, like I was bragging. So I had to like act like I was unhappy about it. Because <laughs> as soon as you rejoiced, <laughs> he couldn't take it. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to play that game of the world. Amen? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the, the truth by the word of God. There is joy, so much joy in the presence of God that you can't even fully understand it. There's so much peace. There's no confusion when you're serving God. You can have questions and you can have moments where you don't know what to do, but that's different than confusion. You know what confusion does? Opens the door to every evil work. Just lets the devil slide in there and steal your peace and your joy. Will not be confused. So what I want to do, before we take this communion, I'd like for everybody to bow their head. And what I, what I feel led by the Holy Spirit to do right now, I'm going to say a prayer that, that to get you into the kingdom of God if you're not already in. I believe in saying the, the salvation prayer. Because the Bible says you believe with your heart and you confess him with your mouth, you'll be saved. And so I know this is new to some of you and you're not quite sure. You think you might have to go to a 10-step program. No, nope, one step. 
You believe in Jesus Christ with your heart right here, right now. Believe that he is God's son and you humble yourself to the lordship of Jesus and you know that God raised him from the dead and he died for your sins. The Bible says you ask him into your heart, you'll be born again, you'll be saved. And then you know what God does? He makes you a new creation in your spirit and he downloads himself into you. He puts his spirit in you. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God through Christ Jesus. And oh, by the way, that Holy Spirit that he gives you, Jesus said he's there to be with you forever. He's for your life journey. Amen. He's your companion. He's your help. He's your wisdom. Amen. And so let's the whole congregation say this prayer. Heavenly Father. I believe that Jesus is your son. He died on the cross for my sins. And you rose him from the dead. And now he sits at your right hand. Jesus, come into my life. I humble myself to you. Jesus, be my Lord. And Savior. and Savior, cleanse me from all of the past, cleanse me from all of the past. And, make me new. and make me new, for I believe in you. For I believe in you. Amen. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. amen. Okay, we can drink of the grape juice. And real quick before we go, the Holy Spirit just put this in my, my heart. They're getting the food ready. It should be about ready when we get down there. But some things are more important than food. Now, there's, there's someone in here that every time they try to get close to the Lord, every time they, they, they believe in the Lord, but they keep their thoughts of, of things that they did wrong in the past just keeps coming into their mind. And I want to tell you a little story. <clears throat> there's a famous pastor or minister by the name of Ken Copeland. Many people in here know who Ken Copeland is. He's a good faith teacher, wonderful. We had our start in a lot of his teachings. And the, the Lord came to him one day, and he said, Ken, tell me about that cabin that you and your wife Gloria had in, in Colorado. He's talking to the Lord like this. And, and he wasn't talking to him audibly. He was just speaking to him in here. You can hear him loud and clear in your spirit. And uh, Ken said, oh, Lord, that was a beautiful cabin. He said, we could look out the, the kitchen window and see the mountains. It was beautiful. And he starts telling the Lord how him and Gloria built an addition on it and where they could keep their motorcycles. And he's just going through this big story about this cabin that they used to have. And the Lord said this. He said, Ken, do you know that cabin does not exist anywhere but in your mind right now? And he thought about it. He, th he thought, that's right, because we sold that property, and they bulldozed the cabin down. So the only place that cabin really existed was in his mind now, right? Currently, in his mind. And then the Lord said this, that's the way it is with the sins of my people. They only exist in their mind. They don't exist with me. And I want you to know that. That's for somebody. When the, when you truly, when the Lord truly speaks, you, you'll know it. To speak right into your spirit. Don't you, don't you let the devil steal your joy. You've got to have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. The cleansing power of a man, a God man, that hung on a cross. They nailed his hands to the cross. They nailed his feet. They whipped him. They put a spear in his side. They brutalized him because he came to die. He who knew no sin took all of your sin on himself on that cross so that you could be free. Amen. Now the rest of your days, you talk to the Father and you go to him like you belong. You go with, with, a, with a, 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 a pride, a sense of belonging, and you tell him everything that's going on and he'll give you the strength. Amen. Amen. Okay. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming. Please feel free to come down to the picnic. And as I said, if you weren't prepared, it's okay. We got lots of food. And so I think that the, um, the food should be pretty much ready. So we'll just go down there, Sister Darlene. You'll see her down there. Um, 
what we like to do if, if, if for, the, for the older people that need help or mothers with, with children, you know, just go, go right up to the front of the line. Everybody knows that's how we do it. So don't think like you're butting in line somewhere. We want you to go first. So you're not standing there waiting forever, right? And the rest of us will we'll fill, we'll fill in behind you. So, um, so if you need any kind of assistance, you have children you need to take care of, if it's hard for you to stand, just, just go right up front and get your food, okay? Go, what's that? And Oh, yeah, thank you. If you need a ride down to the pavilion, Sister Valerie's here. She has the, the landmaster out there. She'll give you a ride. And I hear she's a pretty good driver. You don't have to be afraid. <laughs> what's that? You charge, you charge two dollars. Oh, two dollars. No. <laughs> oh yeah. Some people like it to go fast. That's a special ride. We'll do that later. You have to put the seatbelt on now. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> okay. Well, God bless you guys, and I'm gonna pray over the food too. So it's already blessed, and and uh, thank you for coming today. Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you for these precious souls that are here. Father, I thank you that, you know, there are oftentimes, Lord, when I'm giving these messages, I can just feel your love for them, Lord God. It's just so real and so strong. And I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit, when, it, when these words come out of my mouth, Lord, because they're of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will take these, these words and put it right into their innermost being, Lord. And I thank you that that's where that word will stay so that it can grow and develop, Father. And so, Father, I thank you for keeping them safe and happy and healthy in all that they do. And now, Lord, we thank you for this food. Thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to live in the most prosperous, blessed country that ever existed, Lord. And, Father, we thank you for that. Father, we know that through our history, the country has done things that weren't good and, and, and that we weren't proud of. But, Lord, it never represented your heart when they did these things. And it never represented um, the heart of, of the founders, the believers, Lord. But, Lord, I thank you that also every time these things happened, Lord God, that were harmful and, and, and downright evil, it was the goodness of God in the hearts of Americans that made it right, that overcame these things, Lord, oftentimes giving their life, Father God, for the just cause. So, Father, we thank you that this country was created by a people who love you, and we have a covenant with you, and you'll never forsake our country, Lord. So, Father, we pray that you heal our land, too. Heal our land, Lord, and we pray, Father, for, for in these upcoming elections, Lord, we pray for godly leaders. Father, we don't want harm for those that, that are ungodly. We just want them removed. And, Lord, may, may they go get a cabin and go fishing all day or something. But, Lord, we want righteousness back in the government. We want law and order and justice back in the government, Lord God. For you said, Lord, when the, when the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. But when the righteous are in, in authority, the people rejoice. So, Father, I'm not calling out either person, either party, or anything. You know what's in the people's hearts, Lord. So, Father... May these godly leaders step up and take their place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.